get rolling here. All right. We've got a lot to cover tonight, and I need to turn on the projector so these guys can see where I'm looking at. I want to quickly, I want, I want to make sure, because we lost last week, and thank you all for being so understanding. Uh, I had a wonderful, if you guys who are sitting here with me can visualize this place was full, front row to back. Um, and then we had Dr. Terry Scott in here. If you don't know who Dr. Scott is, he is a professor here. Actually, he's a professor emeritus uh, with uh, special ed. His area of expertise is working with uh, behaviorally disturbed kids. And he is a nationally, internationally recognized expert. But what I like about him is he's just down home, good old, I was a teacher kind of guy. And that's the first thing he tells you is how he got his first job. As he said, making a high four figures. <laughs> Which is what my first job was to do. So we've been friends for a very long time. He's a good guy. I want to kind of reinforce the reason why I break this book up the way I do is because there's two very two different, I feel, that uh, Dr. Fullen takes two very different points of view in chapters two and three and four and five. And I think uh, it's not simplistic to say that two and three is the bad news and four and five is the good news. If I feel like that we have covered it enough that I can walk away and have closed the circle that I want to close tonight. So you guys have an understanding of, well, why in the hell did we read this book, Steve? What's the point? Um, and then if we have, if I had that feeling, I'm going to move into TPAC and just hang in there with me and I'll explain the rationale of how all this goes together. So last week we were introduced to, there's Dr. Fullen, um, his ideas about the new pedagogy and the flipped teaching. Then what happened though was when we hear all of that, we then meet this guy and then we met this lady. And then, of course, you know, McLuhan from 1967 saying kids are learning more outside of school than they are inside of school. Wow. Um, but Larry Rosen, let's let's settle on Larry for a little bit, because the first lady, Maggie, you know, she's all about distractibility, that we're the we're the distracted generation, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, right. We get that. We understand. But this guy, what I loved about Rosen was he walks in and lays some facts on the table. He walks in and lays some research on the table. Good stuff that directs, directly relates to what we deal with as, as educators. The whole 15 minutes is as long as we can hold attention. There really isn't anything. The whole concept of multitasking is a fraud. It's a scam that people use before we really got serious about looking at technology and education because, you know, we would argue, we would say, well, kids can multitask. No, kids cannot multitask. Nobody can. In fact, all we can do is switch task, um, which is what, when you look at it, the data shows us that women do much, much better than men. Um, and, you know, insert joke there if you want to. But when you look at it, his work, I think, really, really brings home the point that we are dealing with a different kind of kid. And then along comes Prinsky, and Prinsky reinforces that idea. Now, Prinsky basically is out there saying things that, frankly, we've been saying for a very long time. In fact, you're going to hear from one of the people who, have been, who, is, who was and still is saying this. And that's where the, the sort of the sage on the stage, guide on the side, that whole dichotomy, you know, comes from is the idea that we should be more guide on the side instead of sage on the stage. Um, and I, as I said, I used to use his partnering pedagogy book and I really, really liked it. Um, but then the more I would read it and the more it, it just, it didn't fit with the message that I'm trying to get across here. We then looked at, we didn't really look at Don. I sort of mentioning Don Tapscott. He's the guy that's made a um, fortune off of this net generation thing. Again, emphasizing the fact that kids are different. Uh, then Clay Shirky shows up 
And Clay talks about the cognitive surplus that we all carry around in our heads. We have so much information now. He coined the term information overload. We have so much information now. How in the world are we going to deal with it? And then you go back to Rosen, who basically says, well, you only got 15 minutes where you pay attention to anything anyway. You know, and you, you kind of get this idea we're in trouble. How are we going to deal with the fact we've got these people in our rooms who are hyper distractible, who can't put their devices down for more than what did Rosen say? Five minutes, I think, was the deal he gave. It. You know, we this is what we're up against. And then Clay comes along and he basically says, we have this amazing amount of information out there. How are we going to handle all of that? And then I gave you the curveball. <laughs> I deliberately gave you the curveball. This is Kevin Kelly. Uh, he is one of the founders of Wired Magazine. And so Kevin basically goes off on this almost uh, religious tact where he's like, what does technology want? And it's, it's an interesting idea. But I think, let me show you where I think we need to go. Wagner, same thing. All right. So, you know, for those of you who may, well, I'm just going to say, what I do is I put the recording of the class below the sort of where all the writing is, if that makes any sense. Let's go back and look at Mike's, Dr. Fullen's uh, quote here. The integration of technology and pedagogy to maximize learning must meet four criteria. It must be irresistibly engaging, elegantly efficient, in other words, challenging but easy to use, technologically ubiquitous, and steeped in real life problem solving. The problem we have with this is we've had some really, really stupid ideas that came along uh, five to ten years ago. When we first saw the first wave of technology kind of come into schools, um, you know, we, we had people talking about all schools needed to have internet access. Uh, then we started talking about all schools needed to have fiber optic access because the, the copper internet access was just too slow, the bandwidth was too small. We needed to have, everybody should be able to have the ability to have a, a video conference from their classroom. And then we had people come along and try to create standards for this. And I don't mean standards for technology. I mean standards for the whole shooting match. 21st century skills ring a bell with anybody? The rainbow connection, as I called it. So we had these people out there trying to cram these ideas into a format and a formula that somehow gave us meaning to using technology in the classroom. My argument was, have you read Fullen's book? Have you looked at these four simple criteria? Make it irresistibly engaging. Well, it's already that. Elegantly efficient. Hmm. Elegantly efficient. So in other words, we know this from our being taught as teachers about that you want to teach to someone's challenge level, not to their frustration level. And you want, you don't want to teach to their, well, I could do this in my sleep level, but you want to somehow get up there into that challenge level so that the curve is a little bit steeper, but it's attainable. And as Terry kept saying last week to the folks that were sitting here in this room, you have to be positive, 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 positive. You, as an adult and as a teacher, feel like you're faking it when you do it, because a lot of times you just want to tell everybody to go to hell. But he said, if you can just get into the habit of being positive, 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 and if you can get to the point where your curriculum becomes challenging, he said, then what will happen is kids will buy in and go along for the ride. The technologically ubiquitous is where we're kind of at now. Um, you know, we're going to be looking at uh, the Google Classroom here in, in a couple of two or three weeks. And that's the, the newest kid in town. 
before the Google Classroom, teachers were being told all about where well, you should blog, you should have wikis, you should have a YouTube channel. Now the Goog jumps in and goes, no, here, we just give it to you. Go play with it. Because the Google really doesn't have a monetary interest in you using the Google Classroom. They don't. They really, really don't. Uh, I, have, I have a dear friend of mine who works out at, uh, at Google, out at Mountain View, and he came from UofL's speed school, was bored in speed school, went over to business school and caught the entrepreneurial bug. And then because he was such a high flying uh, programmer type, Google came and got him and said, we're not interested in you programming for us. We're interested in you helping us with the ideas that we have for education. One of those ideas was the classroom. So he calls me up every once in a while and he says, man, you wait till you see what's coming next. So you know what's coming next? Okay, you know all about the Google Cardboard thing, right? Where you can put a little thing on and it's free. And then you can put your phone in it and you can go and wander around. They want to do that on screen. So in other words, you're sitting on your Chromebook, but you've got a different kind of Google Cardboard on your face that allows you then to immerse yourself into the screen, go and look around. Okay. Uh, that's coming very quickly. Be here very soon. What it's going to do, I don't know. It could be another one of those answers looking for a question. You know, I think in Mark's world, it would be interesting. You know, because then I could be standing there on Mars because I got enough pictures of Mars now. I mean, you can see that in Google Earth now that I could wander around in the terrain and, and maybe, maybe make some observations about why this would be different than, say, standing on a volcano here in, in on Earth. Right. And let's look at the differences in formation and ground and so on. So that's that's coming. And then, of course, the real life problem solving. We've been dealing with real life problem solving since Firefox, guys. Sorry, Foxfire. I get those two mixed up. So Foxfire was uh, an outgrowth of the Mother Earth movement in the 70s and 80s, where we were doing it all wrong. And, and all schools should look like Berea College, where kids went to school, but they also learned to trade to pay for them going to school. Um, and we tried to duplicate that into classrooms. And then it kind of was like, why are we teaching kids to make brooms? So then we, everybody said, well, you know, really what it's about is understanding how to use uh, technology in real life problem solving. So now you see that morphed now into something that looks like project based learning. Let's do it with PBL. And the PBL projects that the district does are interesting. Uh, trebuchets, I, I was a part of that over at Wagner, the kids building trebuchets in a um, math class to understand how curve on area under a curve, um, you know, classic quadratic thing, so on and so on. But again, my question was, I'm not, don't think we're building too many trebuchets out there anymore. So, but I get it. And then I had a buddy who also taught at Wagner, she was physics. Now, she did something very problem solving, but it was she basically gave kids a box of junk. And she came, I remember she came here one night and she was talking to me about my class and how she was doing it. And she kept looking over at my box of junk. You know, every technologist has a box of junk. And she said, can I look through your stuff and can I have whatever's in there if I want it? Go ahead. So she took about half of my box of junk. And then when I showed up at her classroom to watch the challenge she gave given the kids, I got it. So she would give them a box of junk and then they had to design a car that could drive up this mountain that they uh, had built in an art class that she was borrowing for uh, her class. Now the art class had, had done the mountain trying to make it as true to form with the kind of mountain that it could be, whether it was built by sedimentary rock and folding or whether it was a volcano, so on and so on. So they then had to identify the kind of mountain they were going to climb and then they had to build the car from the parts. And then they had to identify what laws of phys physics they were using 
concepts of physics they seem to do that. Of course, the first question was, well, where is the gasoline engine? Oh, no, we can't have gasoline. We're sorry. Where is the electric motors? And she said, build one. So, I, you know, I, I like that kind of stuff because that's the kind of stuff I like doing. But I don't know how much real life problem solving that is. One of my mentors is a lady by the name of Marlene Scardamalia, who teaches up at University of Toronto. And one of her things, she she's a big, big knowledge building guru. In fact, she and Fullen are really good friends. That's how I got to meet Mike. Their thing is we should have real, real life problem solving. Let's look at a real, real problem and let us let it be based in something that is directly related to what affects kids. So this is where Mike takes off in chapters four and five. I'm going to do the same thing we did last week. We're going to sit around the virtual campfire and we're going to take a look at the people that are in uh, four and five. And of course we have to start with this guy. Remember I told you where this was filmed? This is the alley outside of OISI, the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education. So in other words, over here is the landing dock of the, uh, of the building. And there's a set of stairs that go down. You walk across the parking lot. And then this building that's behind Dr. Fullen in this shot is, believe it or not, a set of old Edwardian um, dormitories. I stayed at them one time, you know, because I thought it'd be cool. I thought it'd be like Hogwarts, right, or a British boarding school. No, it was just ridiculously bad, and the place smelled, and, you know, the bathrooms you didn't want to go in without shoes on, and so on. But anyway, and then down that alley, and then out across the street is a nice pub. I guess that's why I remember it. But let's, let's hear what Mike has to say. Hang on. Hang on. Let me get this up. Uh, maybe I should have put my. They're called, that will be familiar to most people, uh, critical thinking, communication, creativity, collaboration, character education, and citizenship. How do Let me stop there to help you all especially my friend here is from JCPS. What he's talking about there is an idea in a book that Dr. Fullen wrote called Deep Learning. You ever heard of Deep Learning, my friend? These are the six C's that come out of that whole thing. The thing that bothers me about what you are being told in JCPS is nobody's talking about this guy. Anyway. Does technology uh, relate to those? I'm gonna call those six the deep learning goals. And it turns out that if you purposely use technology, you can go a long way to accelerate it. So we have some certain criteria. How does the learning become irresistibly engaging? Students want it uh, and teachers want it. Uh, how, does it. how does it get used without getting too complicated technically? So second one, uh, how do you use technology 24 seven? So you're accessing the information purposefully all around the clock. And then also, how do you do work that's steeped in what we call real life problem solving? The foundation for this, incidentally, is this dynamic relationship between uh, push and pull. So push is the finding, I won't give you all the research, but it's very clear that as students move up the grades from kindergarten onward, they, you know, they are increasingly bored almost everywhere. And so that's, uh, and teachers are somewhat alienated because it's hard to teach the bored. So that, yeah, that's the push factor, it's psychologically pushing people out. The pull factor is the tremendous digital world that's got all kinds of ever-increasing attraction, uh, not all of which is productive, but it is a pull. And so what we're trying to do is say, first of all, this push-pull dynamic is going to cause an explosion. Something's going to give. So let's be there in, as part of the explosion and uh, see how technology can uh, increase the learning. Technology is now so attractive, so seductive, so available, so sophisticated, so uh, kind of... Uh, pervasive in both in its presence and what it can access that you just uh, everybody sort of grows up on that and then it's a question of how do we how do we not get overwhelmed by it uh, we we have a phrase 
when something is that powerful, you want to figure out how to move towards the danger and figure out how to get it on your terms, where you can't hide from it or you can't try it, but then worse things will happen. There you go. So that's, that's Michael's point here in a nutshell. So he's saying that technology is getting to the point now where we can't ignore it anymore. And, you know, people would say, well, we didn't ignore it. We've been using it. Well, you've been using it as a way of teacher to student. We are now coming into a different phase now where it's going to be student technology to teacher. Kids are going to have things in their hands that they can use. We can take the draconian approach of you're not allowed to take your phone out during class. Or we can figure out ways to engage people and empower people in the right way to use it. Now, he, I think he does a nice job there of at least acknowledging the fact that we have to realize that this can be very overwhelming. And anybody who's worked in a classroom where kids have their hands on technology knows that firsthand. Um, and you have to have a really sound structure behind the use. But if you don't allow the use, it's a losing battle all the way around. All right, so that's Mike. Now, the reason why I keep coming back to him is because this class, this class is predicated on that simple statement right there. We are playing with things in this class, not because I necessarily want you to become experts in any one of these technologies we play with, you know, pick the chart. It didn't take you very long to figure out how to use a picture chart. The trick is what would happen if your kids use picture charts? What would happen? What would they create? What would they make out of it? Speaking to Fullen, we have to acknowledge that maybe it's a good fit for something like math. Maybe it's not. It just depends upon your content. We're going to speak to that very eloquently when we get to TPAC, because that's what it wants to talk about. Can we find a way to make it elegantly, elegantly engaging? And if, can we get kids to understand how to use it? And that's Steve's law. If it takes you more than 15 minutes to explain to a kid how to use a piece of software, we're not going to use it. Now, that also means that if it takes me just 15 minutes to give you a sort of quick down and dirty about how to use slides and G Suite, fine. Because I know that if I have structured my class properly, when the questions start arising about, can we do something else besides make a TAM PowerPoint with this thing? Oh, you want to try something else? What if we tried this? So there's another 15 minutes of this is how it works. Although what you find real fast <coughs> is what Mike refers to as the skinny. Kids already know how to do one thing. It's a quick jump to the next level, which takes us to the whole idea about that it's challenging, but at the same time, yeah, I've got a grounding, so I'm ready for it. Give it to me. The technologically ubiquitous, that's what's coming. And I have said this, and I'll say it again, you're getting tired of it, but I'll have a bet with any high school teacher, I won't bet middle school people yet, but I'll bet a high school teacher that in five years, you'll have a period, you'll have a, a class, you'll have a preparation called online. And it's going to look like something. Because the other bet is in five years, Google Classroom will be gone. Something else will have replaced it. You know, Microsoft will have kind of had a Microsoft moment because that's how they work. <laughs> Microsoft will wake up and they'll go, well, hey, what happened to all that money we were making off of those enterprise licenses that we had? Oh, Google took it all. Well, let's uh, let's revamp Office again so it's easier to. That'll be their way of looking at it. Let's make it easier for people to use. So they'll instead of they'll, instead of the ribbon, they'll have nice big you know boxes that you can click on. But it'll change. The thing that won't change is you will be responsible for a <coughs> classroom that will be online as one of your preparations. And it will be that way because of all the kids that we lose, because they have to go have jobs, uh, because they're pregnant, or they have to support their family. 
And then the last one, and I think the hardest one, is that whole real life problem solving. I don't think we've ever figured that out. Because it, it gets to be almost cheesy. You know, it's like, today we're going to figure out how to use a quadratic formula in a real life situation. And your textbooks are full of these things. I remember we had a, an amazing math teacher over at uh, No Middle School. And she won the Mathematics Teacher of the Year Award in the United States. And she did it through a project that was how I got involved with her using an online uh, database. So don't, don't think of database. Think of more like Facebook, where kids could go in and they could leave their ideas in these nice little boxes. And then I could come in and read like Steve's and Mark's and then I could leave notes behind that link to their stuff and we could see this marvelous web of, of learning. Uh, we called it the Rand McNally effect. In other words, you went in, you looked at it and the screen was very graphical. The screen would have all these little boxes all over them with all these lines going every which way. Um, and we would tell teachers, you know, the purpose of the lines is to show you how messy learning is. So your first step is, is you put out an idea, you let kids talk about it, you let kids start formulating their theories. And then we then reorganize and say, well, this group up here thinks this, and this group over here thinks that, and this group over here thinks that. So let's put them into their own little learning groups and let them go to work. This is all based on research that uh, this Dr. Scardamania I told you about from the University of Toronto had done with R&D departments in industry to try to understand what do they do that we could mimic in schools. It was a great idea. It still is a great idea, but 20 years ago, it was a great idea. Now it's like, what? You just do that with, yeah, you're right, you can't. The thing that was so cool about it though was kids were able to say, here's the problem that I see it. And I don't mean problem like, here's my problem. I don't want I meant, here's the way I see the curriculum. Here's the way I want to understand how it fits. And what was interesting about that, because we did research on this, you would have thought that the kids that came to the table with this really large experiential background would be the kids who would, who would just eat this thing alive. And then the kids who came to the table with a very small experiential background would be the kids who struggled, you know, because they'd be like, well, I don't, what do you mean? I, I don't. Um, and what we found that was really interesting was, is the high flying kids just wanted to know what, it, what to do to get an A. And the low experiential kids were like, I always wondered why. I always wondered how. And it took a while. You really had to develop a class uh, culture of questions being asked. It wasn't embarrassing to ask a stupid question. In fact, one of the things we found in the in this database thing was kids would ask things they would never ask in class because they would felt like they'd be viewed as stupid in class. But when they would ask it in the database, they would find that others would be more willing to jump in and say, well, what they're trying to say is this that, and the other. It's a really interesting, we did a lot of research on it. I could make you silly with boredom over it because it was one of those things that it just time marched past it. And <laughs> as I told Marlene many years later, we missed we missed our, our time to jump because she got offers from both Apple and Microsoft to buy the, the software, the concept. And they then were going to employ it. This is back when Apple was heavy into education and Microsoft was just getting into education. <clears throat> and they were both would employ it in their education parts. We're talking like millions of dollars here. We're not talking, you know, chump change. But she wouldn't do it because she wanted to hang on to it because she's a researcher and it came from a group of people that she worked with that she felt very close to. And I was one of those people. And so we were um, all very excited. But then, like I said, it kind of ran out of gas. But the point is, there is clearly, clearly, room for this kind of thinking. All right, so we talked about Mike. Phil Schelecki. Ever heard of Phil Schelecki, Steve? No, sir. Mark, you ever heard of Phil Schelecki? 
Would it surprise you if I told you he lived here in Louisville? He is an internationally recognized uh, educator. He was a part of the original, Stephen, the original Jefferson County's attempt um, after busing was in, initiated, the whole magnet school concept. They hired Phil, Phil Shalecki, they hired him to come in and kind of help them figure out what we could do to restructure schools so that we could make them exciting, engaging places for people to be at. And what was interesting was they turned him loose into certain places because they were very diverse. Then those are going to become the model schools that then everybody else was just going to follow. Right? In other words, we did it here. Why can't you do it over there? So that we picked places like King Elementary. You walk out the front door of King, you go right there, Shawnee Park, you know, block down. We did it over at uh, Brandeis Elementary, which sits, you know, right in the smack dab in the middle of a, of a rundown part of town. We did it at No, because at the time, you know, No, we don't know we're here, even though it was a new school, um, had a very challenging uh, en enrollment. So we put it in places, uh, Shawnee was another one. We put it in places where we could say, well, we could do it here. And so Phil was brought in to basically work with teachers to help them understand um, how to get ki kids engaged. One of his uh, taglines, and unfortunately this clip, I, there's a lot of Shalekti out there. If you look him up on YouTube, he's everywhere. But he's, he, he and Mike both had the same problem. They just do not present well. I mean, it's their voices just, they don't do well. Whereas like, what is the, I love about the Rosen thing is he's, he's a damn good presenter. I could sit and listen to Larry Rosen all night. So I didn't go get a Phil Schlechty thing. Phil sounds like he's from Kentucky, if you know what I mean, uh, which isn't a bad thing because I sound like I'm from Kentucky. But what I'm saying is I wanted to find something and he has a bad habit, just like me. He, he goes off into stories. So I'm going to let you just hear his whole idea is the levels of engagement in five minutes. Select these levels of engagement in less than five minutes, I promise. If you watch this scene from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you'll notice that even in the midst of a boring lesson, none of the students are actually misbehaving. They're quiet. Nobody's tossing spitballs or playing those paper football games or checking their cell phones because, well, the cell phones back then were the size of a brick. Remember the Zach Morris phone. But most of the students are essentially following the rules. They aren't engaged. But what are they? Well, some seem to be retreating. A few seem to be playing the game of school. But nobody is actually committed to the learning. Well, here's where Schlechty's levels of engagement becomes helpful. It provides a useful framework for thinking about what it means for students to be genuinely engaged in their learning. Schlechty defines it this way. Engagement is active. It requires the students to be attentive as well as in attendance. It requires students to be committed to the task and find some inherent value in what he or she is being asked to do. The engaged student not only does the task assigned, but also does the task with enthusiasm and diligence. In 2002, Philip Schlechty developed a framework for thinking about student engagement based on two core ideas of attention and commitment. At the bottom, you have rebellion, which involves diverted attention and no commitment to the task. This is the student who seems to be acting out and causing disruptions, and as a result, they fail to learn from the task. Next, you have retreatism with no attention and no commitment. Unlike the rebellion, this student in retreat is not actively disrupting the learning, but instead seems to be kind of checked out. This student is often distracted and emotionally withdrawn from the task, and as a result, this student learns little or nothing from the task. At the next level, you have ritual compliance. This involves both low attention and low commitment. Unlike retreatism, a ritually compliant student doesn't completely check out, 
but instead is doing the bare minimum to avoid confrontation. This student will learn at a low level and the task will not be retained over time. Next is strategic compliance. Often this looks like engagement because the student might be performing at a high level, but it's not. Here the student has high attention on the task, but low commitment to what he or she is doing. This is the student who is playing the game of school, focused on things like grades, parental approval, rewards, and class rank. But the learning isn't intrinsically rewarding, and as a result, this student will often learn at a high level, but fails to retain the learning over time or transfer it to a new context. And then finally, you have engagement. This requires both high attention and high commitment. Here a student completely buys in out of a strong sense of intrinsic motivation, and this includes meaning and choice and challenge. This student will continue focusing even when the task gets more complex and challenging, and often they're going to choose to learn even when it is ungraded. This student will learn at a deep level and the transfer will continue to new contacts. And this is why it's important that we as teachers focus on how to make the subject intrinsically engaging. And this happens when we tap into student curiosity and creativity and purpose. And when this happens, students are more likely to grow into passionate, lifelong learners. Simple, huh? <laughs> Let me tell you, give you an idea about this. I worked with a lady um, who was a special ed professor here, and I was uh, a special ed teacher. And I came to her with an idea about looking at how people retained their learning. And here was, here was my premise. I'm going to do this, guys. And uh, Carrie, what I'm doing is I'm wheeling over in front of the screen. Do we all know what a normal distribution curve looks like? The bell-shaped curve, right? Okay. So we were looking at the folks who live at this end of the bell-shaped curve, which is two standard deviations above and more. And then we were looking at the folks who live at this end of the curve, two standard deviations and more below. Now, I went with the two standard deviations below because I, once you get past that, you're dealing with people who are physically damaged, right? They've had a brain trauma or they've had a stroke or something like that. And that's a different, that's a different folk called together. We were looking at children who had been identified as Down syndrome, okay? Um, in the district, that's, they're now referred to as FMD, functionally mentally handicapped. And then we were looking at folks who are in AP classes, and I mean advanced placement classes. What were you looking at? What did you learn? What do you remember from what you learned? Okay. And what we found was the people who were in the AP classes who had scored well, scored high, ACTs and all that SATs, couldn't sit down and really weave together what they had learned to you. If you ask them, so what did you learn in your calculus class? They could give you formulas and functions and so on. But if you then ask them, well, how does that weave, together? how do you use that? American history. They could tell you exactly to the date, et cetera, about things that had happened in American history. You'd ask kids who are at this other end and you'd say, so what have you learned? And they would give you very concrete life skills kind of learning. I can read the bathroom science. So when I'm out with my mom or dad and I need to use the bathroom, I won't walk into the wrong one. I now know how to tell time. I'm not really good at it, but I can get close enough. I can handle money again. I'm not that good at it, but I can tell if someone tries to cheat me. I can read. I like to read. I read some things that I like, but most of the time I just read so I can understand things. Oh, mathematics. Yes, I can add and I can subtract, and I can use a chart to figure out how to multiply and, and divide 
and I have a calculator. Okay. Now, when I say children with Down syndrome, we within, and here's something you need to understand. Every group you study has a bell-shaped curve. So in other words, if I went down here, this group of kids that were the AP kids, and I gave them an AP test, what's it going to look like, Steve? Uh, Bell-shaped curve. Yes, yes, okay. You're going to have kids that blow the hell out of the thing. You're going to have kids who are like, whoa, whoa. And then you're going to have the greater majority be right here in the middle. It, it, and the same thing with kids with Down syndrome. You'll have kids who are the kids who are very high functioning. We call them high functioning Down syndrome children. I don't know what that means. And then we have low functioning kids. Usually the low functioning kids, it's very much a nurture thing as opposed to a nature thing. Unless the nature thing has to do with the fact you get a very thick thing sometimes with children with Down syndrome. And they, they, they can't get a very good big fat and going. All right. So what was, what did we see about these two groups? These kids over here told us, well, they said I could memorize and I could learn it, the AP kids. And then when I took the test, I was fine. I have a son like that. I have a son who will sit and scream and yell and kick all the way into taking an ACT test when he went off to college and he aced it. I mean, aced it. And he would sit there and go, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> and then I have a daughter who basically frets and fears, and she comes out okay. Let's get back to the, the two groups. So we said to the Down syndrome kids, how, why do you know all this stuff so well? Because I have to use it every single day. I have to know how to do this every single day. Okay? That's called engagement. And one of the things that you try to stress to your FMD teachers, and as someone who was a KTIP person and a resource teacher to them, one of the things I would always stress to them is, yes, there are basic knowledge things we have to give people, A, B, Cs, one, two, threes, one plus two is three. Um, put these letters together, it makes a word. We have to give people that base knowledge, but if we can't put it together into something that meaningfully has impact on their lives, it washes away. And what's so fascinating about working with, I really like working with, with uh, uh, Downs kids, mainly because they're cute, mainly because they're fun. Uh, but really the reason why I like it is their learning is out here. You just see it. Whereas when you work with kids who are very sophisticated, they know how to hide. They know how to hide the learning. Oh yeah, I'll get back with you on that. And then phone comes out and look it up real fast. But, you know, you 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 can see the learning in in a kid who who has difficulty learning. You see it, and so when you see that aha moment, you literally see it. Their eyes get big and they go, oh. You see that with with kids too, but boy, you really see it with them. So when you talk about engagement and technology, it seems that our only way of thinking about it is let's give every kid in the room a Chromebook. They'll be engaged. Yeah, but is it what you want them to be engaged with? So to me, what we have to do first is we have to do that first task of can we make the curriculum challenging? Can we then give kids stuff to do that wakes them up and kind of makes them a little bit, oh, yeah, okay, I kind of see it. I'm not so sure about where I'm going with it yet, but yeah, I kind of see it. And then we can bring the technology in and say, so what if we tried using pick the chart as a way for you to graphically, I don't want a lot of words, I want pictures that then would demonstrate your understanding of it. And then all of a sudden you start getting people engaged. Now, what you'll, and I've seen this too many times, what you'll see happen is the kids who are the high flying kids, a lot of them are literate folks. And they'll want to say, can I use words? Sure, go ahead, write all you want. And so what you'll you end up having is you'll get, you get one of the picture charts, one of the infographics, which will be full of words, you know, in boxes. That's okay, that's fine too. The really, the kids who are real high flyers, what you'll see is a box 
and then an arrow that draws over to here and then draws over to there and draws over there. Those are those kids that have a whole hell of a lot of connections in their brain. And that's how they think. Those are the people that you want to have in your room. If you have a whole room full of those people, and I have worked with a whole room full of those kind of kids, they will drive you nuts because every single one of them has a different way of solving the problem. You're up there and you're saying, okay, so for us to solve for X, we do this, we do this, we do this. And then those kids are sitting out there. They're already, you know, over here past you and they're going, well, what if I did, hey, listen, I've already done this back here and I did it this way and I got the same answer as you. Can we do that? No. You, as the content expert, are sitting there going, yeah, you got that answer because of this problem. Now go try it on another problem. And then when they can't get it to work, what do they do? They keep trying to make it fit into that other problem, which is okay, which is okay. But finally, <laughs> what will happen is they'll get turned off and they'll just blame you and you know, they check out. All right. You want to get to some good news? Let me give you some good news. This guy. And then we'll end up, um, we'll take the last heavy lift out of the book and I'll let Michael have the last word on change knowledge. This is what Fullen is famous for, by the way, the change knowledge bit that was in, what is it, chapter five, I think. Uh, that's why he's on the wall out here. He's a Grandmeyer Award winner. He's out there on the wall. Uh, you know what I mean? The hall, all those pictures down the hall, on the hall there. That's all the folks that have been Grandmeyer Award winners. He's one of those. Uh, and he, he's one of those because of change knowledge. But let's not, let's, let's wait from that and let you hear some good news. Ready? I'm almost at 1,200 meta-analysis. Quarter of a billion students. Most of the work is based on classroom assessment. What teachers do. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Fill you in. When he says he's got a quarter of a billion students, what the hell does that mean? He got a hell of a lot of data. Let me help you understand how people like this look at data. Michael talks about this in the book a little bit. I don't think he does a very good job. And this is how education research works. This is how education research works. Okay. And when we talk about education research, there's three levels. <laughs> I had to look at see I had three fingers. Three levels. There's quantitative, there's qualitative, and now coming up fast on the outside is action research. So quantitative is that classic example that if you've ever had a stats class, you got it thrown in your face. You got your control group, you got your experimental group, we do ship to them and let's see what happens, okay? Qualitative basically says, so how did they feel about it? I'm really simplifying here. And if my colleagues were here in the room with me, they'd be going, that's not what it is. Okay, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. We want to give all those surveys. Well, and then action research is all about you, Mr. Stephen. It's all about what does the teacher see and what does the teacher want to know? I think, as somebody who's done all three, I think it's probably where we should be landing these days. All right. let, me, let me walk you through where these guys are coming from. So do you know what the effect is, what, it, what we mean when, we, when we're looking at the effect? All right, let me help you. So in as he just said, when we look at stuff in education, it's usually done through the lens of assessment. And that can be informal, it can be formal, okay? So when Mark's out there with his kids uh, and they're all underneath the, uh, are they underneath the tent, Mark? Is that? Is is it fair to call it that? I don't want to insult that's, you. That's fine. Okay. So when he's got them in there, he's asking questions, isn't he? So what is this? Where is that? Da, da, da. That is informal testing. Is solid as it can be. Formative assessment. This guy does formative assessment. He also does summative assessment. Both of these are legitimate ways of doing assessment. So when these guys start talking to you, what they normally do is they take control experimental group. They employ the same assessment. Why? You've got to do something that has a, you know, the same. You have a standard. So I'm going to come up with a 20 question. Well, what are we learning these days, my friend? Oh, um, uh, exponential functions. Thank you. I thought you were. I was, going to, I was going to fill it in for you. All right. So we're doing exponential functions. At some point, he's going to be given a test. 
chapter test, how do you do them? Uh, just a CUDA software generator and yep. I got it. Okay, so he's gonna do that. Now, what he could do is over here would be his control group. So they would be made up the people who he would do what he's always done. And he would say, here's, here's my review. Uh, he would go over it in class. He would have them fill out the boxes in the class. He would do all that kind of good teaching stuff that I'm sure Steve does. That's his control group. Over here in the experimental group, he basically comes into class and he pulls up his Google Classroom. He says, you all have access to Google Classroom now. I don't know my, talk to me after class. Well, I can't get, okay, talk after class. He has that ability in his classroom. So, sorry, I'll get back. What he can do at this point is he can say to them, use the Google Classroom and prepare for the test. I've got videos in there. I've got videos of myself explaining to you again how to do uh, the stuff we learned about exponents. I have all of that in there for you. And what he was careful to do was the amount of time it took me to sit there and fill out his review sheets and the amount of time it took me to sit there and look at the stuff he had online, they're fairly similar time span, okay? So what happens then? They go and take the test. I don't know what just happened here. Let me jump back in real fast. So Steve, have you ever done anything like that? Uh, not, with, um, not with the... Uh computer or any type of uh, software, but maybe have done different types of exams mm -hmm. uh, on the same day with the same class. Now, and here's why, this is why quantitative gets in trouble. And you can, I think, see it. Yeah. It's called CITI, C-I-T-I. And CITI has at its foundation, I'd take a CITI training when I came here, do no harm. So I can't in my classroom do that kind of division thing because I might do harm to these guys over here if what I did over there has a significantly higher effect. In other words, they do better on the test, okay? It can work either way, right? The kids over here who do the classic fill in the blanks, take it home and study, uh, do a hell of a lot better than the kids over here who had to, who, you know, you could come up with all reasons for that, couldn't you? Well, I couldn't get to it. Da, 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 da. All right. So when he talks about effect size in the chapters, this is what he's saying. So what you do is you take the mean of those two groups. You know what mean is, right? Average, good old average. Okay, so I take the average and I take the average, put them together, divide by the standard deviation. So the standard deviation should be, well, it will be, there'll be a standard number that says, okay, between where the kids fell in the bell-shaped curve that did what everybody thinks they would do, in other words, they got 50% correct, and then where the kids fell who aced it and the kids who failed it, that standard deviation then will give me an effect number, okay? It's always a fraction, well, not always, but it should be a fraction. The closer you get to one, the closer you get to one tells you that what you did had an effect. So in other words, what it would say is the fact that he gave the kids over here the use of technology, something happened. Something happened. Now, the kids over here who took the test, they might, they might skew it so far, you might come up with a negative effect number, which is kind of rare, but does happen. What does that mean? Well, that means that everybody over here probably failed the test, right? Because you would have, well, how many kids you got, like 26? Yeah. Okay. So over here you had, let's, let's call it 13 kids that, that did that, 13 kids who used the technology. So the 13 kids over here, everybody failed. Everybody got a zero. So you add all that up, you add, you got a zero. And over here, your kids kind of come in kind of across the, all over the place. Well, you will end up with a negative effect there because what we're saying there is something really weird just happened, okay? And so you have to kind of take a step back and go, wow, I mean, these guys didn't get it at all. The good news is something happened over here, 
You with me? And the closer you get to one, now, if you pass one, get the champagne out because something really important just happened. Okay. So that's when we talk about size effect. So let me get back down here to this guy, Mr. Quarter Billion Kids and teachers that he's looked at. So what he's arguing with you is, folks, I got tons of data. This is what Terry said when he came in here last week. He said, I got 17,000 kids and teachers and I can tell you what teachers do, what kids do matters. Because I've got an effect size of 0.95, which means, whoa, so stuff you're doing actually means something. So listen to what he says, it's good news. I'm almost at 1,200 meta-analyses, quarter of a billion students. Most of the work is based on classroom assessment, what teachers do in their classrooms. Yes, there are standardized tests there, and there is NAIT tests and other things, and yes, most of it is in the English-speaking developed countries, so that's the extent. Certainly, I'm looking at four-year-olds to 20-year-olds. And this, to me, is the most interesting finding of the lot. If you look at the whole distribution of a quarter of a billion students and you ask. All right. So here's what I want you to look at. Here. See what he's got? You can, he never shows this whole thing. So I, I tried and tried to find this where you could actually see, you know, he's, see his negatives over here. Okay. So he'll tell you. I'll, I'll let it go now. How many things do you do to students that have a decrease on their performance? The most exciting news for you this afternoon is there's hardly anything you do that harms kids. You'd never know that from the media. Every school needs but to hey, watch this a video. A quarter of a billion students. And some of these down here make perfect sense. Like the effect of bullying on achievement is minus 0.22. Yeah, makes sense. You get that? In other words, that effect size is minus two, two. That's a hell of an effect size, right? Because what it's saying is it has a very negative impact on what kids do. Getting back to our example with Steve here. So if we got a negative size effect in his class. What we can determine is something we were doing really sucked. <laughs> something we were doing really did not work at all which then could take you back and you could have a conversation about, well, did you do a good job explaining to the kids? Did you do a good job of teaching to the kids? You know, what went wrong here? All right, now I'm gonna let him go. Here comes the really good news. And so when you take that into account, I think the most fascinating finding from all the work I've done is 95 to 98% of things that we do to students enhances achievement. All you need to enhance achievement is a pulse. Virtually everything works and we've got to stop arguing that what works matters because everything works. Mrs. Smith down the road, she comes to you and says you should do this in your school. She's right. It will work. When your head of education in this state or whatever state you're in goes to bed last night and wakes up in the middle of the night with a bright idea, it will work. And the teachers that I want to drum out of the profession is those who come to you and say, look, this is the kids' work at the start of the year, and look where they are at the end of the year. Everybody can do that. The most interesting part next is that, look, up in this zone here, we have an incredible number of teachers and schools in our system that have a remarkable, systematic, positive impact on kids. And certainly point four is about a year's growth. And if I look at the United States of America, and in the PISA results, you're around 20th or so, and I know that your country gets upset with that, and you should remind them there's 140 countries behind you. <laughs> but you're up there. And when I analyze that results, and certainly as I've done with some of your um, No Child Left Behind results, I can say with some confidence that probably 60% of teachers in schools in this country, in this zone, success is all around us. You don't have to go to Finland and Shanghai to discover success. It's here. In fact, I was. You all know that reference. 
So he's out there on the wall too. So there's this Finnish educator. They gave him the Grandmar Award. I, I don't know why. Uh, he came in here and basically what he did is he preached at us about, this is why our kids excel. He started off with their, you know, self-discovery and letting kids, you know, have owned their learning and everything. And then there was this um, smart aleck in the crowd who raised his hand and said, what does the diversity look like in your classroom? And he got real humpy and he goes, what do you mean by that? And I go, well, I mean, are all of your children Finnish? Do you have any migrant children in your classrooms? Do you have any kind of diversity in your classroom? That's not our point. He said, our point is, is we allow children to explore their learning. Yeah. But the problem with it is when you got a heterogeneous group, homogeneous group, what does that do to the effect size, right? Because the effect size then says anything you do, anything you do, there'll be achievement. And if your goal is to have kids learn how to regurgitate facts without application, you look great. You look great on paper. Okay. What we have done in this country is exactly what I believe he was saying. And that is because his data of a quarter billion people shows that whatever we do will affect achievement. We get everybody and their brother comes out of the woodwork, 21st century learning skills. Perfect example. Coming out of the woodwork and they say, if we just do this, We'll improve achievement. And so we all run to that for a while and then we all kind of go and we look at it and then the scores come back and they're still. Now, if we had a curriculum that says we will teach to the test, what do you think our scores would be like? Through the roof. It's as simple as that, guys. It's as simple as that. What we have to decide we have two problems staring us down right now. We have this wave of technology that is ready to crash down upon us. It already has crashed. And are we prepared then to figure out how are we going to deal with people sitting out there in our classrooms like this room? Last week when I had this room, by the way, Carrie is an entire computer lab. So everybody's got a computer. So last week, one of the things that I did is I didn't say anything to anybody. You know, the people who walk around um, who have to have total control, you know what I'm talking about, would have stood up here in front of the class and gone, now we have Dr. Scott here tonight, and I want to make sure that everyone pays very close attention to Dr. Scott. So please, please do not go anywhere on your computers. As a matter of fact, what I'd like you to do is to move your keyboards. I didn't do that because I wanted to see what would happen. Because I know Terry. Now, Terry is not going to go and, and challenge anybody. That's not his style. But I, I also knew that he was a heck of a presenter. So I wanted to see. So I go back there and stand in the back, back there where the windows are. And now, you all know that I'm legally blind, so I can't see specifically what you're looking at on your screens, but I sure as heck know what Facebook looks like. And I sure as heck know what Instagram looks like, or I sure as know what mail looks like. So I'm back there. And so we had 32 people sitting in this room. Quick count at the beginning of Dr. Scott, they already had gone. They already were gone. You know, they were back there, kind of looking around. Where's Steve? Well, we don't know who Steve is. So we don't care about Steve because they didn't. They didn't know who I was. So, you know, they're starting. Terry starts rolling up here. And what I noticed as he got rolling was people started dropping off. He would make he would make comments about this is the worst room to teach in. I agree. Because you can when I've had this room with lots of folks in here and I wander because I'm a wanderer when I teach. People would get very uneasy. You know, you could literally see their body language going, why are you coming in this row? Couldn't away. He would complain about that and he would start walking down that outside 
row over there. And people in the room who were really pewter savvy, what were they doing? Because you see kids do this all the time. They were dropping their screens. And then, you know, he didn't make any notice of it. And he'd go back. So now I'm watching to see, okay, so he's wandered out here. They see that he can see what they're doing. He makes no notice of it. Then he goes into role playing where he picked on this poor guy. And he was talking to them about positive, positive, positive. And he showed them the effect of negative. And he had a thing up here on the screen he called a cush. A cush. And he said, what is a cush? It is a colorful geometric shape. And we're going to learn about cush today. So he put up the classic examples of a cush is not. A cush is not. And then they were making guesses as to what a cush could be. Well, the classic guy, and you know him, you know him, you especially, Stephen, know him, the classic guy that sits there and goes, well, it could be a, and it was the wrong answer. Well, in this role playing that Terry was doing, he came down on him like a ton of bricks and just squashed him. And the whole room just went into one of those, what? And you heard people in the back of the room going, who is he to talk to him that way? And he quickly then came back out of role and he said, that's what we do to kill kids. That's how we kill kids. We squash them. And he said, I'm here to tell you th that even if he gave me the wrong answer, I can respond back in a positive way. You're thinking. I can tell you're thinking. But let's look at that again. And he did it a whole different way. But the more, and he, he was here for a good two hours. And everybody in the room, by the time he was finished, was totally in attention with him. So the good news is that when we do things, we will affect achievement. The bad news is we have to start thinking about what is the outcome? Are we really preparing people to be critical thinkers? Are we preparing people to be able to be just test takers? And that is so old. We've heard it so many times. I know you're tired of it. But what I'm here to argue with you about is we can make a huge difference in that equation, in that calculus, with the use of technology. So we're going to finish up here with Mike talking about change knowledge. This is his claim to fame. He's going to talk about using the right drivers. Uh, this question on right and wrong drivers, I hope will become clear as we talk about it. Uh, the criteria I used to uh, sort them out, so to speak, uh, were these four. Uh, does uh, a driver uh, will define in a moment, but it's mostly the, uh, that's meant to so-called drive the system forward for improvement. Okay, so my gonna, question for the given policy is... I'm going to stop you right there. So let's, let's go ahead and frame that. Let's see if we can put some meat on this bone he's put out here. So let's say use of technology in classroom is the driver. Okay. And now let's listen to what Mike would say. Does it foster intrinsic motivation on the part of teachers to put in the effort to get the results? Does it engage teachers and students in continuous improvement uh, that keep engaged? Is it really engaging? Uh, does it inspire? You'll see the importance of teamwork when I get to one pair of drivers. And does it affect uh, all students and all teachers? This is that all systems uh, uh, go uh, uh, criterion. So we want to have these uh, four things happening. Uh, I'm not saying that the policy will cause it to happen the next day, but in the course of a very short period of time, it better be making gains on these kinds of criteria. If you think about drivers themselves, a simple definition, a policy, an associated set of strategies that are designed to affect positively the whole system reform. So a wrong driver is one that uh, the evidence points to the fact that it doesn't have that impact. A uh, right driver is one that uh, is on the right track. It gets results. It makes progress. Think of it this way. This is the overview. I'll, I'll, I want to say a few words about each of them. Down the left-hand side, you see the wrong drivers. That is, they are drivers that a lot of policymakers depend on. They increase accountability and have 
punitive consequences uh, uh, to it. They start to develop uh, individualistic strategies. How do we get more and better teachers? How do we do teacher appraisal, merit pay? Uh, technology, technology is uh, so great, let's have more of it. Fragmented strategies, uh, ad hoc strategies. So down the right-hand side are the ones that we've been working with as drivers. The way to express this, I've used the concept, the metaphor of the brain, is that the right brain is normally the kind of the steering mechanism for what we think about and do. And that's how these should be thought of. So the left side is not so much that they're wrong all the time, but they're wrong to count on at the front end of things. And that, in fact, you can use them in the service of the other ones, but, but you have to put them in perspective. You have to put them in that kind of sequence of thinking. All right, I'm going to go back to that. That is one of the keys, and I don't want to lose it. So let me, oh, Mike. Mike, Mike, Mike. Don't you love all the Geico ads that are back on? I love the uh, camel one that comes through. What we think about it. All right, so let's stop right here. This is his right and wrong domain, or right and the wrong driver. So let's look at this real fast. Look, Premier, this is where we've been going. This is what we've been beating on the doors about for a very long, long time. Um, we're going we're gonna to make sure that you're teaching what you should be teaching there, Mr. and Mrs. Teacher. We're going to make sure because, by God, we're going to hold you accountable. And we're going to make sure that you're the best it can be because we're going to have these quality matters, these guidelines. And then we're going to throw a lot of technology at you because, well, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that sentence. We're going to give you technology because, you know, we're going to have everybody in the whole district have a Google Classroom. We're going to have everybody in the whole district use these digital backpacks because, you know, and then when you hold them down, they'll give you a very nice, long explanation of why this. And forget that. I'm pointing to technology and pedagogy, those of you in the great beyond. We get a long description of why we're going to use this technology and how it's going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. And then we forget about you, the teacher, and pedagogy and how you're going to use it. And fragment strategies. This gets back to what we just saw with our good friend and all the good news. Our problem is we come in with something, we try it, we say, look, it worked. And then we come in and we go, but you know, we got this new thing and it works too. And so let's go do that for a while. Instead, what we should be doing is PLC should actually have PLC function as opposed to just being paper passed down from uh, administrative offices. Collaborative work should look like teachers actually working to design curriculum together and kids working to understand the curriculum together and pedagogy, we should have pedagogy out the wazoo. Different, this is why I'm focusing on this. Because the next thing we're gonna look at is something called TPAC, and it is all about this. And then, is this something that is permeated throughout the system? In other words, when I walk in to, I'm not gonna see the same thing. I'm not gonna see the same thing. What I'm gonna see is Southern's way of doing it, and Ballard's way of doing it, and Atherton's way of doing it. And it all has merit because it meets those areas. <coughs> Excuse me. This is you, my friends who are in this class. This is the College of Education and Human Development and University of Lovell's framework. It's called Ideas to Action. Now, this used to be front and center in every class I had to teach at this place, and then it kind of went away. Kind of like what we just talked about with the whole technology thing. We tried it for a while, and what happened? Well, but let me come back to it, because I think this is very, very, very important. Inquiry. What we're sitting here doing tonight. 
And when we talk about TPAC, I will be the first to stand up and raise my hand and say, I do bad pedagogy because I sit here and talk at you. Not too much longer. So inquiry is that I got to know stuff. I got to understand stuff. The action is the application of inquiry. So this is where Steve is asking you to create these infographics that he does look at folks and he does take to heart and says, they got it, they get it. The last piece is where I am taking you by the hand very gently and I am leading you down a bunny trail. I'm taking you on a journey. I'm trying to get you to understand as a technologist, in other words, somebody who's interested in this stuff, I'm trying to get you to see how we can be the people in our buildings who say, ah, oh, we're going to get all those Chromebooks. Can we sit and have a conversation about the pedagogy that we would use with the Chromebooks? Oh, no. What we need to learn, first of all, is how to open the lid, turn it on, and make sure it's connected to the Wi-Fi. And No, we don't need to know that because that is, that falls into that 15 minute rule. If it takes 15 minutes, fine. If it takes longer, then we're gonna come back to it and we're gonna break it down into chunks. But I can tell you right now, understanding how to use a Chromebook doesn't take more than 15 minutes. Now, understanding how to use Google Classroom and G Suite, yeah, that takes a little bit longer. The point is, we keep coming back to the same focus, and that is pedagogy, pedagogy, pedagogy. How does this change my pedagogy that will have that effect size of one? So that when I were to give kids a test in two different classes, what I should see is since they're both using technology, the effect size should get close to one, meaning it had some effect, okay? All right, now, tell me truthfully, guys, are you tired? A little warm. Yeah, I am too. <laughs> can, I just, can I just outline it and then, what, Carrie? We hear you, but we don't, I mean, we see you, but we don't hear you. I turned my microphone on. Yeah, I'm tired. Okay. Can I just do a quick outline and then we'll, we'll leave? Is that okay with everybody? Oh, yeah. All right. So let's, we know what we're doing for this one. And Heather's already put hers in. Love, Heather. Love you, Heather. Let's look at what Heather did this time, just for giggles. So when we look at Heather's, Well, Steve, let's go back and look at Heather's the whole thing. She has lots and lots of pictures. Good for her. Proud of her. And let's go to view to original. It's kind of hard for me to see. How about you all? We'll zoom in a little bit here. Nice. Look what she did. So she did this nice little graphic. I'd love to know what she is. She's looking at criteria for, oh, and she puts it around it. I get it. You see it, guys? So she put that in the center, and then she's got that. Now she's got the bow and arrow. Lacks technology, minimal focus on, right? Right? Oh, she did do 21st century. Good for you. Goals are vague. Pedagogy is neglected. Technology has almost no role. She's right. And here's, you know, this is, this was really interesting about 21st skills. Those of us who are, you know, who do this, uh, the, the organization that represents technology use standards out there in the United States is called ISTE. I'm sure Carrie knows what that is. Um, it is a, you know, it's, it's a group, just like any group, just like the national math group and the national English teachers group and all that. So ISTE, International Society for Technology and Education, when 21st century skills came out, it tried to figure out how to shoehorn <laughs> technology standards into it. And it was a total, total disaster. It was really fun to watch them try to figure it out. 
And then this one, I didn't talk too much about the game thing. Um, I have a problem with gaming. Uh, and this goes back to when I was a specialist and I would go around and visit schools. I'd walk in the, well, first of all, I'd walk into the principal's office, say, hi, I'm here today. Just going down, check the computer lab, see how we're doing. And they would say, love that Mrs. Smith, love that Mrs. Smith. I walk into her classroom and there's no noise and everything is quiet. Well, you know there's a problem there, right, right there. You go down, especially in elementary. You go down and you walk in. The first thing you notice is every kid is sitting there with their headphones on their head. And then every kid is sitting there playing a game on the computer. What is Mrs. Smith doing? Nothing. Okay. So the human interaction just kind of went out the window. And then I would either get two arguments. One argument was, well, we do this when they've done all their work and they've done really good work, they get free choice day. That was one argument that was given to me. The other was, I could show you the data that shows that they have done well on these very exciting mass games that they're playing. Then my next question was, can you show me the data, what they do back in their classroom? Well, I don't talk to her. I'm done. So that I, you know, in fact, at one time in this course, guys, in one time in this course, I taught you how to make online games. But I just don't, I, I see it as, as that sort of uh, hook, but it has to come from you. It has to be your stuff. And we're going to do it, by the way. Um, change knowledge. See that one up there about knowledge building? That's where I come in. That was what I was involved with. That's how I met Dr. Fullen, was through knowledge building. That's another whole course. And then he's got this down here, or she's got this down here, right? Right? Dead on. Excellent. That's what I look forward to seeing, is when you guys put together stuff like this. Now, let me do real fast on TPAC. I'm not going to do TPAC. I'm just going to give you the outline of it, and then we'll get going. What is TPAC? We are looking at, when we do this alphabet soup thing, we are looking at three, two different kinds of frameworks through three different ways of looking at it. The first kind of framework is called conceptual. That's the framework that researchers use where they go out and they're trying to understand what people are doing with anything. And then the others have to do with practitioners. Okay. So when you look at, I said conceptual, I meant theoretical. When you look at theoretical frameworks, that's all about research. It's all about research. That's somebody sitting in the back of the room watching you do stuff and see if it makes changes. Conceptual is what we as educators, as practitioners want to understand because it has impact on us. So TPAC is a conceptual frame, framework. It's an interesting one. That's why I keep it. Um, when I first came here to university, everybody was like, well, we have to do TPAC. Why? Well, because it's a conceptual framework that's research-based. Well, so is Tim and so does UDL. <laughs> the difference is Tim, the technology integration matrix, is a way of looking at behaviors. What are people doing who have technology in their classroom or not doing that have technology in their classroom? And then UDL, which is near and dear to my heart, is universal design for learning. This is how do we use technology so that everyone is included into the curriculum? And what we do with technology is a huge benefit to some with benefit to all. It's as simple as that. Um, I have a huge, huge soft spot in my head for universal design for learning. So what we'll do when, we, when I see you next Thursday, where we'll pick up is we'll fly into TPAC. I'll give TPAC its due. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that has to do with TPAC. Uh, there is even a really important PowerPoint that I'm not going to throw at you that I'm going to reference because 
it helps to see it. But we will jump into playing. And we've, we've got a nice resource for playing. And we're then going to use as our tool for you to create your understandings of these three ideas, something called a blend space. Again, a blend space is a very powerful way for students to demonstrate understandings. Um, one last thought, and then I'll let you go. This is pick the chart. So there is now pick the charts that have collaboration built into them. So if I wanted to give a group of kids in my class an area that I want them to do demonstrations to the rest of the class about, I can say you, 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 and you. Mar uh, Steve, go in and create the first, uh, just pick the infographic. In other words, just get the blank show. And then the rest of you are going to join in, and then you all can shut the door. And the rest of the people in the room can't see what you're doing until you're ready to come out and show it to us. That is new to pick the chart, and that is something that I would encourage you to, in your repertoire, to take a look at. Blend space kind of does the same thing. And uh, I have a lot of people who use blend space. They like it a lot. And I'll show you some of their examples when we get into it. But that's our technology tool that we'll be using. Uh, the other thing that we'll be using is a wiki site that I have created that has multiple, multiple videos. So guys, be ready next week because you're going to be watching videos. Not me, you. You get to pick them. Um, that have to do with people teaching with technology. People find these really interesting. This is the link to it. And what I do here is I give you a quick down and dirty what TPAC is and what Tim is and all of that. But what really is interesting is over here. And what we're going to be doing, what you're going to be doing, is you're going to be taking your first stab at looking at some of these videos and seeing how you see the TPAC being demonstrated in here. Now, what we'll do with it when we're ready for you to create it within the blend space is you're going to put in a video that demonstrates the TPAC, a video that demonstrates Tim, and a video that demonstrates a UDL, and you're going to explain to me if or not explain to me if, you can explain to me how each one represents that. Um, people who can figure out they can find one video that does all three, besides loving you to death, I don't know how to reward you because most of you are in the great beyond. But if you can find it, I sure would like to know it. I think it's in here. I think I've seen a couple in here that would qualify. All right. So that's next week. I'll probably do this all again next Monday when I send you out the review. You guys got any questions? I think Steve came in with the bit. Well, let's give Steve the last word. And he's sitting over here and he's too far away for the mic to pick him up. So I'm going to try to paraphrase what you said, my friend. He said a couple of things when he came in here early. He said, number one, he said, holy smoke, I now see what this book is talking about at my second thing. He said is they're telling us to do things, but they're not telling us how or why or what the impact is. Is that a fair statement, my friend? And that is where the TPAC is going to speak to us. And unfortunately, it doesn't speak in eloquently ways. It speaks in high-blown academia speak, which is a shame because I take away from it a very central, very simple mantra. A couple of them. One says this. Teachers will not, cannot embrace technology use in their classrooms until they have opportunities to explore in playful ways. That's an actual physically social term, so, uh, sociology term, by the way, sociological term, in playful ways with the technology so that it, they can see where the hooks and where it makes sense into their curriculum. Now, I have done this with some of the most technophobic people you have ever laid your eyes on. And by the way, that is not an ageist comment. I've seen, 
I've seen people who were in their early 20s who would come in and would know how to turn these machines on in here. And I've seen people in their 60s who come in and just plow through using technology because that's their mind. They, they are just ready to learn something new. But when you see people who are really technophobic, who really don't, when they're given an opportunity to make those little connections, I could see how I could use this in my classroom. That win will carry you a very long way when you come back and say, let's try this, see how that goes. So what we look at next week is TPAC and the ped pedagogical dance. How about that? Or the pedagogical slide. So I'm finished for the evening. Thank you all for being here. I hope those of you in the great beyond, these are making sense to you. If they are not, do not hesitate to yell at me. Um, and you know how to do that. You basically send me texts. You already have done that. Don't send me emails, please. Um, not because I don't read my emails, I do, but you get buried in all the other emails. And when I'm working with you in a class, I want that instant. So you got a question about this so that I can get back to you or more importantly, I can see I screwed something up and I need to go back and visit it again. Good night, everybody. Stay warm. We've only got a couple more days and then we'll be in the 60s by the weekend. Thank you, Carrie, for being honest about you're tired. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay.